Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Somebody wrote me today and um, about how they knew somebody that believed in what is called universalism. What is universalism? Well, that's the belief that anybody can be saved by their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I've covered a little bit of this in previous studies, um, but let me tell you, I was, uh, I learned from uh, Pastor Dan Gaiman Church of Israel, Shell City, Missouri, S-C-H-E-L-L, -L, City, Missouri. And, uh, well, let me tell you a little story. When I first came back to the Lord, uh, 1990, late 89, 1990, uh, I wrote them and asked them for some Bible materials, told them I was brand new to the faith, and uh, told them the people that had been to their church for uh, the festivals, feast days, and uh, they sent me a box, probably nine inches by 12 inches by 12 inches, uh, maybe, you know, one square foot, just full of uh, audio and books. I mean, that kept me busy for at least a month or so. And uh, I had a little bit of money from an accident, and I kind of, I didn't go to work. And all I did was, I just ate, slept, and studied the Bible for quite a while. And uh, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if this church is for real, show me. Now, I had known in middle school, junior high school, whatever they call it, around 8th uh, grade, 8th and ninth grade, um, I had believed and I attended a Baptist private school because the public schools were so bad. Um, let's just say that diversity reigned in the... Um, middle school, public school that I went to, and we had problems. I mean, it was bad. But um, the um, they had taught me that the King James was the Bible. For some reason, that came right away. All right, so here it is. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if this church is for real and their doctrines are correct, show me. Well, you know what? Um, I put in, well, <laughs> cassettes. I put in a cassette and uh, Pastor Gaiman was talking and says, all right, turn your Bible to, you know, such and such a place. Now, you got to realize there are 66 books in the Bible, approximately three quarters of a million words. That's 750,000 words. And the only two books in the Bible I knew where they were was Genesis, the first, and Revelation, the last. All the other 60-some-odd books in the middle, no idea, no clue. So he says, okay, uh, let's read from, you know, whatever. This book, chapter and verse. I flipped open my Bible. Guess what? Right there. Right there. And then he read it, and then he says, oh, okay, now let's go to, you know, next, uh, another book, another chapter and verse. I flip open the Bible, guess what? Right there. And happened again, and again, and again. After it happened about, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 times, I said, okay, Lord, I get the message. I understand. I won't question anymore. I mean, what are the chances of that happening? Uh, 0. 0.000001 to in a million? I don't know. 
I mean, you know, it, it just happened at, at least 10 times, if not a dozen. So I knew right then and there that he was teaching what was common knowledge 100, 200 years ago. And uh, one day I'm going to have to thank him for uh, putting me down the right, what I feel is the right path. But universalism, some people want us to think that anybody and anything and anyone can be saved. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. But uh, these people generally ignore the book of Genesis and the Old Testament. All they want to do is read the New Testament, read somebody else's mail, and then apply it to the whole world. That doesn't work. And Pastor Gaiman once said that uh, heresies have consequences. In other words, false doctrines have consequences. A good example of that is going to be the pre-trib rapture. When people find out that they're going to have to die for their faith, these lukewarm church people that have been told their entire lives that, oh, God wouldn't do that. He's not going to let you suffer and die for your faith. Well, why don't you read the book of Acts about how Paul had been beaten? He had been stoned and left for dead. Stephen was stoned and killed. So, yeah, I had a phone ring. Forgive me. So the deal is, if the uh, whole world can be saved, and it doesn't matter, well, let's bring all the refugees from all the other countries into the UK and into the USA and Canada and uh, the European Union. You know, it doesn't matter, right? But if God wants separation and segregation, well, then universalism is a heresy or a false doctrine, you know? Um, oh, and that's right. I was talking about uh, persecution and in the um, book of Acts. I mean, 10 of the 12 apostles, the original apostles, died for their faith. 10 of them. Of course, Judas hung himself. That doesn't really count. Uh, the only apostle that didn't die for his faith of the original 12 was John, um, who penned the book of Revelation. According to legend, uh, they tried to kill him and they couldn't do it. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, it's not in the Bible, but that's why they banished him um, to the Isle of Patmos. But Stephen was killed for his faith. Um, I mean, come on. But uh, we're, you know, the modern church world is totally exempt from all this. And instead of telling people that they might have to die for their faith, uh, they're teaching them, oh, the pre-trib rapture. Where is that in the Bible? I, I have no idea where the, the pre-trib rapture is in the Bible. But, uh, yeah. Let's take a look at something real quick. In, you know, here we go, Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, this is why they don't like Paul and all the Torah crowd. Uh, they want salvation by law. Salvation by law. If salvation by law worked, in Jeremiah 31, 31, there'd have been no need for a new covenant. There'd have been no need for it. Keep the law and be saved. <laughs> right? But uh, now they want to take us back to what didn't work the first time. But what didn't work wasn't God's fault. It was our fault because we are sinful flesh. So, you know... 
But in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, speaking of the uh, resurrection, or what some people call the rapture, but it's, it's not really the rapture, it's the uh, resurrection. And there's only two resurrections in the Bible, two. There's a resurrection of the those that are in Christ. That's the first resurrection. And then there's the second resurrection, which happens at the end of the thousand years millennium. Well, what they call millennium, uh, which is Latin for thousand. The thousand year reign of Christ. There's another resurrection at the end of that. That is for the... Uh, those that are in still in their sin, those without Christ. I mean, there's there's two resurrections. The first one's for the just. The second one is for the unjust. If you're in the second resurrection, you're going into the lake of fire to be destroyed. Uh, it's just, that's it. The Bible says, blessed and holy is he that is part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. And I'm kind of paraphrasing that but from memory, but, you know, you want to be in the first resurrection. You want to be in Christ. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, now that's fast, at the last trump, not Donald, at the last trump. Now remember, there are seven trumps in the Bible. That's during the tribulation. That's This is God's wrath on a wicked world. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is not talking about unbelievers. This is talking about believers. Paul says, we shall be changed. So we are changed at the last trump, and where is this found? In Revelation, the last book of the Bible, there are seven trumps, and the seventh trump is the last one and is at the end of the tribulation. There is not a seventh trump prior to the tribulation. The pre-trib rapture is a massive lie and deception. And every single person that teaches this as a fact, whether they teach it out of ignorance or knowingly deceiving people, is going to be found to be a false prophet because that is a prophecy that is a prophecy whether you may not consider it but it's a false prophecy and every single one that teaches that lie when it doesn't happen and people find out that they're going to have to get their heads cut off possibly or you know die for the faith or deny the faith Take your pick. Deny the faith when it comes to Christ, your belief in Christ. Deny the faith to save your life or die for your faith to prove your faith. You know, and people have to face that they might have to get their heads chopped off. That's when you find out who the real, who the real church people are. Oh, but, but my pastor told me I'd never have to see this. You know, God's not a wife beater, you know. Well, God's not beating on that wife. It's the devil's kids beating on that wife. You know, what was, you know, Stephen. Stephen died. He, he was murdered. He was killed. He was stoned to death. You no, know, it wasn't that really good weed that you get at the CBD clinic. No. Nope. He was killed for his faith. And yet there will people tell you that we're better than all those that came before us. We're better than they are. God would never let us suffer for our faith. Oh, it's sad. But, you know, that's why I do a video and I get 68 views, you know, because it's just not popular. So, Universalism. Is everybody, can they be put into the covenant? Well, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 15. 
verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. Now remember, Abram's name was changed to Abraham. The word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? Now you got to remember, this guy's, you know, Abram's probably like 90 years old. You know, there's not many people have children at 90 years old. Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Abram must have thought a lot about Eliezer for him to say, uh, make this guy my steward of my house, make him his children or, or, you know, to be my heir or whatever. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, no children. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the Lord, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Oh, yeah. And he brought him forth and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. You know, <laughs> you look in a dark night sky outside of the city, like in the desert, you're going to see what appears to be millions of stars. And look toward, look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed or children be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Believing in the Lord is counted for righteousness. The book of Hebrews even repeats the same thing. Not law keeping. Sorry, Torah keepers and Hebrew roots and sacred namers. Uh-uh. You can keep all the laws you want. But that's not going to be righteousness. And if you're allergic to the name of Jesus, well... What can I tell you? One day uh, you might find out that Yeshua HaMashiach is not, not the Messiah of the New Testament. So, all right. So Abraham had a son. I think, I think, uh, how old was Abram? When his name was changed to Abraham, father of many nations, not all nations, but he was like 90-something years old, and Sarah was not far behind him. So, you know, how many 80-something-year-old women have children? Uh, none. None. You know, that was a miracle of God. Not quite the same level of miracle as Mary with Jesus, but, you know, it's getting there. All right, so. All right, so I posted a recent study on uh, Abraham going into Hagar, the Egyptian woman, and having a child, Ishmael, but God said that Ishmael was not going to be the heir. Ever heard of inheritance? Yeah, he might have been. He, God was going to bless Ishmael, but Ishmael was not going to be the chosen seed line. He was not going to be the chosen people. No. God would bless. God blessed Ishmael. But he said, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not Ishmael. So let's go to Genesis 21. You know, if you've never read Genesis, you're missing out on a lot. I mean, Genesis is, my opinion, one of the most important books in the Bible. Genesis 21.1, And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord 
did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Yeah. The, what did he say? What did the Lord say? She's going to have a child. Verse 2, And for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old, a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Uh, yeah, so how old was Sarah? Uh, she wasn't no spring chicken, that's for sure. Uh, verse 6, And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. Um, if I remember correctly, her name was Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, and the Lord changed it to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. And if I remember correctly, Sarah means laugh, not laughing like funny, but of joy. You ever heard people laugh with joy? Um, God hath made me to laugh so that all that here will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast that same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian woman, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. So here it is, Ishmael, the son of the bondwoman, the Egyptian, is mocking Isaac. I mean, here it is, he's probably, you know, like 13 years old. I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years old. You know, he's a, probably barely a teenager. And he's mocking Sarah's child. Verse 10, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. Cast them out. Kick them out. I want these two out of my life, out of my home. Get them out of here. Boom. Listen to this. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not, shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. I don't want them here. I don't want them sharing the blessings. I don't want them sharing the inheritance. I want them out of here. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. I'm sure Abraham probably cared deeply about, you know, his son Ishmael. Verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken, or listen, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not Ishmael. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Verse 13. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. See, God blessed Ishmael for Abraham's sake. And because he's a just God. See, Sarah and Abraham jumped the gun, so to speak. You know, well, let's see, I'm old and I can't have children. So, yeah, let me try this Egyptian woman here and I'll have a child with her. Um, you know, when you try to do it your way, and I'm an expert on doing things my way. And I always hit a roadblock or fall into a ditch 
And uh, yeah, I'm an expert on that. Trust me. Believe me. I am. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And if you want, you can keep reading this. You know, God blessed... Um, well, maybe we'll keep reading. All right, so she's in the wilderness, probably in the desert. Verse 15, Now the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast a child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. You know, when you're in the desert and you don't have any water, uh, you're not going to last very long. I mean, even if in a non-desert environment, uh, most people will be dead without water for, in three days. But in the desert, you go a day, day and a half, depending upon how hot it is, you're dead. You don't live very long. So, let me not see the death of the child. And she, uh, she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of the and the angel of God called Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? You know, what's the matter? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. God's gonna make Ishmael a great nation. Oh yeah. Abraham's going to be the father of many nations. But if you listen to the modern church world, uh, that one little nation over in the Middle East, that's all of Abraham. And one nation is not many. So they basically turn God into a liar. But God's not the liar. They're the liars. Just like God said in John chapter 8, speaking of you know whose. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And remember, God's not too crazy about the land of Egypt. So, uh, let's see. Now, if you want to read some more, you could read Genesis chapter 25. Um, Isaac, you know, Isaac was the chosen sea line. Isaac got a wife and uh, he had two children. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and Esau. And God wasn't too crazy about Esau. Yeah. In Genesis 25, 28, we read, And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah, his wife, his you know, Jacob and Esau's mother. But Rebekah loved Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Now, here's an interesting thing. Genesis 26, 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, Judith, isn't that an interesting name? Judith, the daughter of Beer I. I wonder if that's Old Milwaukee or Pabst or uh, Budweiser or Bush. I don't know. And Esau was 40 years old when he took the wife Judith, the daughter of Beer I, the Hittite. Now remember, the Hittites were uh, one of the tribes of the Canaanites. And uh, 
you know, that, that's another reason why universalism isn't, is garbage. The Canaanites, and if you don't know the origin of how the Canaanites came to be, Genesis 6, Job 38, uh, you know, they just, uh, what can I tell you? I mean, that was common knowledge a hundred years ago, but uh, nowadays, oh, angels can't have sex. Angels can't have sex. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The angel says that uh, in the resurrection, um, those that are resurrected um, are neither uh, married or given in marriage, but are the but are as the angels of God in heaven. And guess what? Not all the angels are in heaven. Read Matthew. I mean, uh, read Revelation. I think chapter twelve. Uh, a third of the angels were kicked out. Yeah. Of course, some people will tell you that's future, but I don't believe that. I, I think it happened in the past. So, and Esau was 40 years old when he took the wife, Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Yeah. Do you know that Esau took two wives? And yet in the book of Hebrews, Esau was called a fornicator? Why? I mean, he's married to these women. Why is he called a fornicator? Because they were not acceptable marriage partners is why. So, yeah. All right, let's take a look at uh, Genesis 28, verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not, N-O-T, don't do it, no. You ever notice not is spelled N-O? No. Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, like your stupid brother did. Twice. Not once, but twice. Yeah, he married two of them. Double your pleasure, double your fun. More like double your sin, I guess. I don't know. Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Don't do it. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy father's uh, thy mother's father, and take thee away from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Do you know what the word Laban means in Hebrew? White. Yeah. Sort of like you ever heard of this, you know, Mr. White. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Uh, Breaking Bad? Something, you know, I don't know. Verse 3, and Almighty God bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply. Multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him away from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, a charge, you know, a commandment, a promise, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not, pleased not, Isaac, his father, oh, too late, buddy boy, you already married two of them. Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, uh, Mahalaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So isn't this interesting? Esau took a daughter of uh, Ishmael. 
So I guess uh, they were stepbrothers, half-brothers, whatever. Esau and Ishmael, they were, I don't know. What, is, is that stepbrothers, half-brothers, or I don't know. They're related through Abraham. So he took one of Ishmael's, who generally is considered the father of the Arabs, Ishmael. And I wonder, is the Saudi royal family related to this Ishmael Esau line? Are they related? Are they related to the Canaanites somehow? Do they all intermarry with each other? I, you know, it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. How come in the Middle East, among the Arabs, there's very, 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 very few Christians? Very few. Most seems that uh, most of them are um, into the Quran, ish, you know, Islam, Muslim. You know, there's a seems to be a racial component to religion. I mean, 200 years ago, if you were talking about Christians, you were talking about white Europeans, period. I mean, that's the way it was. If you were talking about the Arabs, you were talking Islam. You go to India, you were talking Hindus. You go to uh, China, you were talking Buddhism. Uh, it just seems like there's a racial connotation there. I, you know, is that racist? I, you know, some say it is, but, you know, they don't want you talking about this stuff. So they throw out these names at you. Um, so... All right. So then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives, which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the daughter of Nebajoth, to be his wife. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Um, yeah, let's keep reading. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Stones for pillows. Hmm, that doesn't sound very comfortable, but. And lay down in that place to sleep, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. A ladder. I did a video on Jacob's ladder. And I wonder, you ever looked at DNA? in a microscope, if ever, anything they've ever told us was true. Supposedly, it looks like a, a ladder, a twisted ladder, DNA. You know, I kind of wonder, is that Jacob's ladder, DNA? Uh, I don't know. But DNA, supposedly under an electron microscope, looks like a, um, a, a ladder that's, well, twisted. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed. Not the whole world. No. Ishmael was rejected. And so was Esau. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. Doesn't that sound like uh, what the Western nations did? Didn't they colonize the world? They went to the north, the south, the east and the west. Isn't that exactly what we did? No other people did this. No other people did this. And yet, the world hates us for doing what God said we would do, what God promised. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth 
be blessed. Well, guess what, people? I remember when there was uh, natural disasters, like there was an earthquake, I think in Nicaragua in the 70s. We collected food and what have you and sent it to them. Uh, and then in Bangladesh, there was a monsoon or like a flood or tornado, or I don't know, not tornado, but it's like a hurricane, but they call it a typhoon and wiped out a er bunch of area and, you know, we sent them food and blankets and, you know, took care of them. Uh, who does that? Who does that? We're like one of the only countries in the world that does that stuff. And in thee and on thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awakened out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone for he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. He anointed it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. You know what Beth means? Beth means house. El is a contraction that has reference to God. You ever heard of Elohim? Uh, yeah. So when you, like in the Spanish, um, there, have you ever heard of El Toro or whatever? Um, it has, anytime you see a place called El, E-L, with a name after it, it has, it, it's kind of a reference to God. So Bethel means house of God. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment, clothing, to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, will I surely give the tenth, the tithe, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. You want to read about uh, Jacob's pillar? Look up the stone, S-T-O-N-E, stone of scone, S-C-O-N-E. Some people believe that the coronation stone in the UK is Jacob's pillar stone. I don't know how true that is. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I've read about it, but... Um, I don't know. You can read about uh, Jeremiah taking Tia, Tifa, T-E-A, T-E-P-H-I, Tia Tefi, Tia Tifa, uh, going to, I think it was Ireland, and brought the stone with them. I don't know how true it is, but wouldn't surprise me. Not at all. Um, I did an entire Bible study on uh, Esau and why God hated Esau and yeah we're gonna get into that God hated Esau uh, <laughs> people will say well I, the word hate really doesn't mean hate it just means you know he loved Jacob more you know he loved Esau but he loved Jacob a lot more no no the King James translators not only were they believers but they were scholars. You should read the, the, the qualifications of uh, the King James translators. I mean, these, peop these were people that knew English, Latin, Greek, Hebrew. I mean, just read about Sir, uh, Sir Lancelot. And no, we're not talking about King Arthur and the Round Table. 
I forget his last, his name was Lancelot something or other, or something or other Lancelot, I forget. Guy was a, they were scholars. And James, the king, he didn't translate the Bible. He just uh, gave them, he took the finest scholars from Oxford and Cambridge, which were Bible colleges, by the way. And he divided these people up into three groups. And they all checked on each other's work. And this way you had, um, everybody was checking on their work. So you had one guy would do half the Old Testament, one group, another group would do the other half of the Old Testament, and the other group would do the New Testament. And then they would sh share their papers, so to speak, and then say, okay, did these guys translate this right, or is there a better way to do it? And when they basically all agreed that it was done right, they assembled it together and then had the printing done. And of course, people will tell you, oh, well, you know, the King James, Trans uh, uh, King James translation was uh, uh, changed or revised. You know, it wasn't changed. It, there was just spelling, uh, the updated spelling. That's all that happened. I think it was a 1769 or 68 or somewhere around there. You know, the 1611 spelling was not standardized. Uh, Webster, you know, the, the dictionary guy, Webster Dictionary, he standardized spelling in the United States. I mean, there were times you could have the same word spelled three or four different ways. And that's not conducive to good scholarship. It really isn't. So he standardized. He spent probably half his life uh, putting together that dictionary. And you know what? He didn't even make hardly any money on it. I mean, it just... Uh, I got a lot of respect for people like that. I mean, that was just basically a labor of love. And by the way, uh, Webster, his 1828 dictionary has a lot of Bible references in it. Yeah, that guy was a scholar. He knew over 20 some odd languages fluently. He could go all over Europe and sp speak to just about anybody. I mean, the guy was a scholar and he knew Greek and he knew Hebrew and Latin and French, German, Spanish, Italian. I mean, you know, you just go through it. He knew it all. Um, and uh, he was a believer. But the uh, King James translators, they were all scholars too and believers, which is a big difference than what you have today with these modern translations. And when you find out that the, um, the NIV publisher is owned by the same company that prints uh, literature by the, the Church of Satan, makes you kind of suspect, you know? People will say, well, you know, they're just printing anything to make money. No, they're Satanists. They're making money, yes, but they're Satanists and they were sent to corrupt the Word of God. The NIV is horrid. The NIV turns Jesus into Lucifer. The NIV turns Jesus into a sinner. And people that read that wonder why they have no spiritual growth. Well, there's a reason for that because it's not the word of God. It's Satan's paraphrase. It's Satan's translation. So, God was not pleased with Esau. Genesis 31 I'm um, Genesis 36 and verse 1. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom, E-D-O-M, Edomites. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Oh yeah. Remember, um, Isaac told Jacob, don't take the daughters of Canaan to be a wife. Don't do it. Don't do it. Jacob, don't do it. 
But Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholabama, the daughter of Anon, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. Yeah. No, thank you. All right, let's go to Obadiah. Obadiah is what is called the Minor Prophets. Uh, they're minor in size, not in importance. Uh, that's why they call them the Minor Prophets. You know, Nahum, uh, Hosea, Jonah. Well, maybe not Jonah, but uh, Ze Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi. Those are some of the some of the what they call minor prophets. You want to know where they are? Go to the book of Matthew and then turn back a few pages. They're just before the New Testament starts. Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 1. And I'm going to ask you, who does this sound like in the modern day world? The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. Now remember, we just read that uh, Esau is Edom, right? It's just another word for Esau. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Who? Edom. Edom is small among the heathen. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Is there a small group of people that are greatly despised among the heathens? Um... Is there a group of people that this seems to apply to? Hmm. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Is there a small group among the heathen that are greatly despised, full of pride? Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they have not have stolen until they had enough? If the grape gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and have and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Listen to this. Ch uh, verse 8. Shall I not in that day what day? I think the second coming. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? Destroy. And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. I don't think the Lord likes these people, do you? You know, but all they have to do is believe in Jesus, Lord, uh, Chaplain Bob. Jesus loves everybody. Uh, I don't think so. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. What? That doesn't sound very Christ-like. And thou shalt be cut off forever? See, there's a reason why the church world so-called 
doesn't read this stuff. They want you to be ignorant. They don't want you to know this stuff. They hide it away. But God loves everybody. I don't think so. You see, when Israel came out of Egypt, um, Esau, Edom, they wouldn't let them go through their land. And they threatened them and told them, you come through our land and we're going to attack you. So much for brotherly love. And by the way, uh, that's what Philadelphia was named for, brotherly love. Phileo. Yeah. No brotherly love with Esau. Nope. And, and Moses even offered to stay on the highways and said, hey, if our, if, our, if our animals eat any of your crops, we'll pay you. If our animals drink your water, we'll pay you. And they said, nope, you go through our land, we're going to attack you. And actually they did. They did attack Israel. So tell me about, you know, brotherly love. Verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. See, when the Babylonians uh, took Jerusalem, Esau uh, wouldn't help Jacob Israel, wouldn't help him. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. See, Esau was happy. Esau, Edom, they were happy in the day that Judah was taken captive and destroyed and Jerusalem was wiped, almost wiped out. They rejoiced. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of thy people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossed way to cut off those of his that did escape. See, those that escaped the Babylonians, the Edomites cut them off to prevent them from getting away. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Oh, yeah. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. You ever heard of revenge, payback, karma? Yeah. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. They shall be as though they never existed. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Listen to this. And the house of Jacob shall be a flame. Uh, I'm sorry. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. You know what stubble is? Uh, when you grow crops like wheat and the plant is dead and you've harvested all the stuff that you could eat, the stubble is what's left over. It's the dried out part of the plant you can't eat. It's of no use. That's stubble. What do you do use what do you do with stubble? You burn it. 
and the house of Jacob shall be a flame and the house of I'm sorry and the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble and they shall kindle in them and devour them kindle you ever heard of kindling a fire oh yeah and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau for the how for the Lord hath spoken it but but Chaplain Bob, all, the, all they have to do now is believe in Jesus. Jesus loves them. That's not what Obadiah says. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. Wow. Wow. All right, let's go to Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H, -A -A 1421. Now remember, Esau, who is Edom, married Canaanites. Remember that. You know, people say, well, you know, Canaanites can be saved. Well, if you say so. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day, when the Lord comes back, and in that day there shall be no more, no more the Canaanite, no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Does that sound like uh, they're going to be hanging around? And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Huh. All right. Universalism. God loves everybody, right? Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Well, maybe we'll read it from the beginning. So nobody accuses me of Taking verses out of context, Chaplain Bob. Ch uh, Malachi chapter 1, another minor prophet. Verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. So this is the word to from the Lord to Israel. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say... Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau. And I hated Esau. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. The Bible says that a man's heritage is his children yeah his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness are dragons a good thing in the bible uh no no read revelation 12 the dragon the old serpent the devil and satan read it don't take my word for it what do i know all right uh heritage Children, Psalms uh, 127, verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And nowadays we say, oh, we don't want children. They're a burden. Let's abort them and get rid of them. Ugh. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Satan says, kill them all. Who are we going to believe? Oh, and the you-know-whos, uh, they want to depopulate the world. But they want to give you a medical treatment to save your life. Yeah. They want to depopulate the world, but they want to give you a medical treatment to uh, save your life. Yeah. I think I'm going to pass. Now, people will say, well, you know, Chaplain Bob, that Malachi, that's the Old Testament. And now we got the New Testament and we got the new and improved God called Jesus. 
And, and, and now Jesus loves everybody. Another reason why they hate Paul. Romans 9.13. Paul affirms, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Not love less. Hated. Yeah. Let's take a look at... Um, Uh, let's see. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Do you know the author of the book of Hebrews is anonymous? Now, personally, I believe Paul probably wrote this book. Probably. But I can't prove it. But yeah, it's pr that's very possible. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Do you know without holiness, you're not going to see the Lord. How do we get holiness? Uh, only in Christ, period. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fall, uh, fail, fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Ooh, how could he be called a fornicator? He married the two Canaanites, and he married Ishmael's daughter. Why is he called a fornicator? Fornicator, fornication is between unmarried people. Adultery would, is sex between married uh, people that are not with their spouse or their wife or husband or whatever. Why is he called a fornicator? Because they were not proper marriage partners. They were never meant to be marriage partners. Listen to this. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You know, Esau had the birthright, which was a double portion of God's blessing. But Esau didn't want it. He despised the gift of God. Can you imagine that? He sold it. He sold it to his brother, Jacob Israel, for... A bowl of beans. Some people say lentils. Can you imagine that? Eh, what good is this birthright thing? You know, this gift of God. I don't want it. My belly's hungry. I want a bowl of those beans. I'll trade you, Jacob Israel. Bowl of beans for God's blessing. What good is it to me now? That's basically what Esau is saying. Can you imagine that? God gives Esau a blessing and Esau hated it. He despised his birthright. Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Esau was rejected. Who rejected him? The Lord rejected Esau. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears, crocodile tears. Oh, boo-hoo, what was me? But he didn't, He that wasn't true repentance, no. Esau was rejected. Ishmael was rejected too, but he was given a blessing. God blessed him and, and made him a great nation. But that's not true with Esau. No, uh-uh. 
All right, where does it say that Esau despised, hated his birthright? Genesis 25, 34. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, you know, lentil stew. And he, Esau, did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. See, Jacob said, uh, Esau came to Jacob and said, hey, I'm hungry. Uh, give me something to eat. Jacob said, yeah, sell me your birthright. Okay, no problem. So, I mean, you could read the whole thing on your own, but basically he's saying, hey, I'm hungry. You know, what good is this birthright going to do me? I'm hungry, you know. Can you imagine that? God gives you a gift and you hate it. You don't want it. Universalism, people. Is Ishmael and his descendants, were they part of the covenant? No. What about Esau, Edom, and his descendants? Are they in this covenant? No. What about the Canaanites? Are they in this covenant? No, they're not. So where do people come up with this universalism stuff? Oh, that's right. They read somebody else's mail and apply it to everybody. It doesn't work that way. It don't work that way, people. You can't read my mail. You know, my dad, if my dad wrote me and said, uh, hey, I'm going to send you a hundred bucks. And, and, and you take my letter and you say, oh, Bob's father's going to send me a hundred dollars. It doesn't work like that. It don't work like that. It ain't like that, people. Universalism is a heresy. God made a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob Israel. Not the whole world. It doesn't work that way. No. What does it say in Galatians 3.29? Well, let's see. Well, let me see. Let's take a look at Galatians 12, chapter 3 and verse. Well, we'll read the whole chapter, I guess. So, Paul. Boy, they hate Paul. You know, there's a reason why they hate Paul. But they really hate Christ. And they hate Jesus. That's why they call him you, ya, ya, you know, shua thingy. Yeah. Because they hate Jesus. I'm convinced of that anyways. I might have to apologize to a, a remnant of them, but uh, yeah. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? And the answer is no, people. Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth it, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Oh yeah, remember? We read about that. Yeah. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, are they talking about all nations in the world? 
China, Japan, Mongolia, Tibet. Uh, is that what they're talking about? Or are they talking about Israel? You know, Simon, Dan, Manasseh, Ephraim, Judah, Levi, Simeon, Iskar, Asher. I think they're talking about all nations. I think they're talking about the 12 tribes or the 13. In thee shall all the nations be blessed. For then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You want to keep the law? Fine. But let me tell you something. Uh, all these Hebrew roots people want us to go back to the law? What does the Bible say to do to those that practice uh, the LB and uh, then the GT thing? Uh, what does the Bible command to do to those that are into that kind of stuff? Well, it's in the book of Leviticus. And, uh, uh, you know, when they talk about keeping the law, they're hypocrites. They really are. Because the Bible tells you what to do with the crowd that practice these things. Uh, and it's not uh, celebrate in parades with them for Pride Month. No, no. Uh, God has another solution. But the Hebrew Roots people, they won't talk, they, no, 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 they won't talk about that. Oh, circumcision, Sabbath keeping, oh, we want you to keep Passover, and this and that and the other, you know, things that are not offensive. Well, if you're going to do keep the law, keep the whole law. Do like Jos King Josiah did. Josiah got rid of people that rejected the Lord. He got rid of them. Those that practiced uh, uh, let's just say the sins of the like this Pride Month. Yeah, those kind of sins. He got rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep that law. But they'll never do that because that's not what it's all about. They want you to reject Christ and keep their little stupid laws. Look up the seven laws of Noah. Yeah, where is that in the Bible? Uh, it's not. It's tradition that exists only in the minds of a certain group of people over in the Middle East that wail at a certain wall. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you're going to do the law, do all of it. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for, that the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. See, the law is not a curse. We were unable to keep the law. And the curse of the law was death. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. See, the Bible, uh, people knew that uh, hanging on a tree was a curse. Why do you think they used to hang criminals back in the Old West? They'd hang them from a tree because they were cursed. You were a cattle rustler. You were a horse thief. You were a murderer. A rapist. Yeah, you'd hang. They would hang you. You know? Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That word Gentile is the same word for 
nations. Are they talking about the 12 nations, the 12 tribes? I think so. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Spirit. Wouldn't you rather have the Spirit than the law? Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, let no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. You know, don't try to add to the covenant or try to do away with it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. You know, you make a promise to somebody, hey, I'm, you know, um, I'm going to do a favor for you. But it wasn't, God didn't say, oh, well, if you keep all my laws, I'm going to, you know, give the, you know, do the promise for Abraham. No. No, the promise was the promise and the law was the law. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of, promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. Somebody tell the Hebrew Roots people this. You know, the Torah keepers. You know, if there was a law that could have made us righteous, we would have had it a long time ago. You see why they hate Paul? All these Torah keepers, they hate Paul. They want to take you away from Paul, and they want to bring you back to their little, their, their laws not God's laws, their laws. They're want their, their laws to make try to make you righteous. But the law never made us righteous, never. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which God could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. See, we're all under sin because when Adam sinned, sin fell upon the whole human race, all the descendants of Adam. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Once we're in faith with Christ, we don't need the schoolmaster of the law. Period. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye not become, not, a, not spiritual, seed and if ye be Christ then are ye then you are then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise not through Ishmael 
not through Esau, but through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All right, let's read Romans chapter 5. I don't think I'll read the whole thing, but uh, another, another letter of Paul to the Romans. Verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, but the Torah keepers want you to be justified by keeping the laws. They want you to keep the seven laws of Noah. Yeah. Where's that in the Bible? It's not. Yeah. You see, they got their own little rules to live by. And it doesn't include Jesus. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Does that sound like a false apostle to you? Doesn't to me. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. What? What? Now, they glory in the pre-trib rapture. We're not going to be in tribulation. We're not going to see any trouble. God loves us. We're the bride of Christ. And, and Jesus is not a wife beater. Tell that to Paul. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh us... Uh, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Uh, the Holy Ghost given unto us? Uh, wait a minute. Why do they want us to keep all these laws? Well, I'm going to cover that in a minute. A couple minutes. All right, um, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's talking about me. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See why they hate Paul? Does that sound like a false apostle? These people are, they're deceivers. They're either deceived or deceivers. The Spirit of God is not in them. The Spirit of the devil is in them. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Do you know the modern Bible versions remove those words blood a lot of times? Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Look at that word atonement. At one meant at one meant with God at one with God verse 12 wherefore as by one man Adam as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned and when people tell you that all means all, no, you got to look at the context. It says, for all have sinned. Did Jesus sin? Did Jesus sin? 
when he was alive, did Jesus sin? No. He took on our sins, but he didn't sin. Christ never sinned. If Christ sinned, we have no Savior. So when people tell you, oh, well, all means all. For that all have sinned. Did Jesus sin? No. No, no, no. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. People, let me tell you something. Only Israel was given the law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many, not all, many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment that was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Christ, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Christ, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And I say amen to that. You're going to tell me that, uh, <laughs> that Paul's a false apostle? Woo, I don't think so. All right, let's read Galatians chapter 5. And then we're going to close this out. Universalism, it's a heresy. If universalism is true, open the floodgates. Let all the immigration come in. Let them all come in. And, you know, but if, but if universalism is not true, well, then maybe, you know, you got to look at it. Maybe what's happening to us now is a curse. The flood of the heathen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Free of what? Sin and death. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's the bondage? Trying to earn your righteousness by the law. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You know, there's nothing wrong with being circumcised if you're a guy. Uh, but if you're doing it to for the blessings in the Bible and you're ignoring Christ, well, you got the wrong idea. That if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you Whatsoever of you is justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For though, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You know, even the Old Testament says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. That's the Old Testament, people. 
And then Paul, you know, people come along and say, oh, Paul changed the law. No, Christ changed the law, not Paul. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ, uh, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Getting circumcised or uncircumcised means nothing, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now remember, in the Bible, leaven is always likened unto sin. That's why during the uh, prior to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Bible told you to go through the house and cast out all the leavening materials in your house and to eat unleavened bread, the bread of life, which was Christ. It was the foreshadow of the, the bread of life, which would be Christ, and to cast out the sin or leaven out of our lives. It was symbolic. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little sin will destroy the church. Always does, always will. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they even uh, were even cut off which trouble you. Yeah. Paul, those that trouble those, uh, the Galatians, Paul would like to see them cut off, killed. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, not uh, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Even Paul, even Jesus said that. Um, some of the apostles were arguing over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus said that he, the, the servant, uh, who, who's the servant would be the greatest in the kingdom. I, I don't see any difference between what Christ taught and Paul. I really don't. But some people can't see that. 14. For all the laws have filled in one word, even in this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And hopefully you don't live next door to the uh, LB and the uh, the G and the, uh, you know, the T people next door. Or the Church of Satan next door. Yeah. Eesh. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Good advice. I need to take that advice a lot of times. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Listen to this carefully. Listen. But if ye be led of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, if you're led of the Holy Spirit, but if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Tell that to the Hebrew roots heretics. Tell that to the Torah keepers. Tell them you need to be saved and get the Holy Spirit. Because they don't have it. Because they would know this. There's a reason why they don't like Paul. They hate Paul. But they hate, not only do they hate Paul, but they hate the one who sent Paul, which was Christ. But if ye be led of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, Murders, drunkenness, revelings. Revelings, what's that? Parting, right? 
and such like, of the which, will I, which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions, with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. And Galatians 5.18 puts a knife into the heart of Torahism and Hebrew roots. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Period. You know why they hate Paul? Yeah. Because they want you to keep the law and tell you that's going to make you righteous. Not your faith in Jesus. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeah. No thanks. Universalism, people, it's a heresy. Period. So, what can I tell you? Oh my, uh, an hour and 40 minutes? This is a long one. Should I apologize? Eh, I don't know. Probably not. All right, well, uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.